Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. The Philadelphia Flyers snag one point against the Islanders. And it's really hard to swallow losing out on that one point once it gets to the shootout because they come at a premium. You need to gather all the points that you can get. You're fighting with the Boston Bruins. Not that I think this team deserves to be in that dogfight for a playoff team because they have been a mess to this point and they are clearly missing something and there are so many internal issues with the squad. So I'm not saying that they should be in a different area in the standings, but here's what I know. They are competing for that spot and deep down in that locker room, they look at it as, hey, we got to get every point we possibly can get. So losing out on that one... It sucks. It definitely hurts. Now, that effort-wise, that was one of the better efforts you got in quite some time. The month of March, disaster doesn't even really define how brutal it was, how painful it was, and all the turnovers, the sloppiness, the poor play. It was on another level in March. If you're relating, and that is a really low bar to set, but if you are going to set the bar at March, well, you played better than that. And you got to credit two guys that have been getting a lot of heat to this point, which one makes no sense in Claude Giroux. He gets destroyed by majority of the fan base, which is a laughing joke. And Carter Hart. Carter Hart stepped up. And this goes back to A.V.'s statement the other day where he somewhat criticized Carter. He needs to be better. We're going to put him away for a couple games. Hey, you're not going to play. You're going to be scratched. I want you to focus on certain areas of your game. With the goalie coach, and that got a lot of heat, and a, a, a lot of people looked at AV with a few question marks and a couple of eyebrow raises. But I almost felt because when you're a coach, and I mentioned this previously, you coach players differently. You can talk to Claude Giroux differently than Joel Farabee, differently to Twarinski, differently to Scott Lawton. You need to know your personnel. You can push buttons on players more than others. And with Carter Hart, I think A.V. knew that he can get more out of him by not questioning Carter Hart, but being tough on Carter to say, hey, go work on your game because Carter Hart has the mentality. Everybody knows what type of hard worker he is. Nobody questions that part of his game. No one questions the mentality side of it and how badly he wants to be a stud in between the pipes. So knowing that you can push certain buttons with him and ask him to do more, demand him to do more, you expect his level of play to jump even higher than what you think he's capable of. Like, he'll answer the bell is my point. Because the way Carter Hart is wired, if you get tough on him, if you not even, you don't, you might not even, you might not even actually think he's not working hard but saying hey you got to work harder to push him to another level you know he will answer with that type of work ethic that is elite and I think you saw Carter Hart really answer AV AV pushed a button and Carter Hart answered it with an insane level of play he had it all around whether it was glove side whether it was blocker side whether it was just tracking the puck in general from shots up at the blue line with traffic in front of the net, whether there was a turnover in the slot area, whether there was some poor mismanagement in the D zone, Carter Hart was awesome, absolutely awesome. Now, there was one turnover defensively that allowed Bavoulier to score his second of the night, but with that much time and space and with the ability to let one rip from that close in, Good luck. You're not stopping that. And the first goal was a power play goal where Sam Moran ends up getting a call for crossing the line with physicality, which you're going to have to limit that. I like the fight, and I think you need a little bit of juice with this team right now because they play flat and they play with no energy. So having a 6'5 body frame out there who's willing to drop the mitts. And not only that, he does a good job with it. He's not some big guy who just drops them to drop them. I think Sam Moran understands what he's doing with the fight where he knows where to throw his punches and there is something to the craft. He seems to have that in his repertoire. So I like the fact that he dropped the mitts and I do think it's important for a team that sometimes plays a little lifeless. But you got to know when you dial it back a bit. You can't just be this enforcer all the time. And that is part of your game. Toughness is part of your game. And you're bringing that to a team that doesn't have much of it. But you got to be smart to allow the Islanders to get a one to nothing lead because uh, Bavoulier gets a, a great pass, great feed from Martin. What a set play. That's a power play that's clicking. That, that's what you know 
you're going to get out of a power play is that knows what he's doing. While you have a five on three for the fly guys and they can't cash in at all. Look what happens when you have set plays and you know your your personnel and you know where you're going to go with the puck and you know what you're going to do with the man advantage. Things look a little smoother, right? But Sam Moran needs to know, I can't put my team in a hole. This isn't the first time he's done it. I forget who they played. It might have been during that Islander series. I don't remember who they played. But it was a couple games ago where Sam Moran ends up cross-checking and giving people all this stuff after the whistle. That's fine. I like it. Don't be dumb. Don't be stupid. He ended up taking a penalty, and whoever they played that night scored on the power play. You got to be smarter, especially when you're a guy who's fighting for his NHL life, who's fighting for that spot. You want to make sure you keep that spot, you earn that spot, and you're in the lineup next night. You can't be taking penalties. As much as you give something to this team that they don't necessarily have, if you're constantly putting your squad in a hole down one nothing, knowing where this team is mentally and how fragile they are emotionally, you cannot constantly do that. And uh, it was a big, it was a big, start to this game for the Islanders. But yeah, the Flyers had power play chances. They weren't able to bury at the end of the first period. Here you are with a chance to make a little bit of noise and you can't cash in. Now they had some shots on Ned and Sorokin definitely played a strong performance once again. He seems to be clicking. Well, you're, you're going to have to bury the biscuit. You are. So Carter Hart, that's the Carter Hart perspective. How about Claude Giroux? The more and more I think about the stripping the C comment, and I know I have fun with it and we joke around about it because it's nonsense. The more and more I really think about how asinine that statement is, it's crazy to me that people truly look at this organization. And this is where I feel bad and I feel sad that there are some Philadelphia sports fans out there with this mentality. I love how passionate we are and I love how much we love our teams and we bleed for our teams. But then there's just a line of, you're an idiot, you're a moron. And the fact that there are really people out there that have watched hockey over the last 20 years, 25 years, they've seen where this league has been, and they've seen where this league has transformed into, and they've seen this Flyers organization over those 20 years, and you think the biggest problem with this team is the man that wears the captain? This guy's going to have a 1,000 games played and probably a 1,000 points at the end of his career. And at the end of the day, there are Philadelphia Flyers fans that look at this team and says the captain is the biggest problem. You need to strip the captaincy off of him because the team plays poorly because of him. Not because the roster is poorly constructed. Not because the defense has problems. Not because you were getting poor goaltending at times. Not because your depth scoring isn't producing. Not because your second overall pick is a bum. No, no, no. Those issues aren't the biggest problem here. Not because your power play is being coached poorly and they're not doing the proper things, but because the captain in the locker room is sending the wrong message, yet he's producing on the ice. I can't believe that there are people out there that think scoring goals is the only thing you need to do if you wear the C. As if you don't look around the league and see plenty of examples of players who wear the C on their chest and they're not the top point producer on their team. They're not the best player. Matthew, Bar Matthew Barzell is the best player on the Islanders. It's not even close. Who wears the captaincy? Oh, that's right, Anders Lee. Now, Anders Lee produces points. He's not even close to the skill level of Matthew Barzell. The list goes on and on and on in the NHL where you just have the guy who shows it out there on the ice. Claude Giroux, I mean, it's crazy that we're talking about a guy who might not quote-unquote score a bunch of goals, but he's going to have 1,000 points in his career with 1,000 games, and he's the biggest joke of this franchise to people. And I know I, I get on a rant about it, every show games, every few games or so, but I don't know how you watch how he put this team on his back and then you think, oh, I can't believe that. Well, the reason is you have poor leadership. It's fine to question Claude Giroux, Borchek, Sean Couturier, Kevin Hayes, A.V., and the, the leadership throughout this organization in moments, in certain situations, in a game where you come out flat, here and there, I think it's fine to criticize any player, 
No player isn't uh, is is just scot free, and you can't ever bring up a flaw or a bad game or a bad shift or a bad back checking sequence because there are times where Claude Drew might have a bad shift. Welcome to hockey. Those stars that you talk about, Connor McDavid's had a bad shift. Hell, he just got fined because of frustration where he threw an elbow into Kakaniemi's face and he got fined for it. Matthew Duchesne, or was it Matt Duchesne? Who was it? No, it was Nathan McKinnon. He ended up throwing his helmet at a player out of frustration trying to rip the helmet off. Everyone has bad shifts. So you want to point out a bad shift here and there? Fine. But this Claude Giroux slander is one of the most pathetic things I've ever heard heard in my life. And the more and more I digest it after watching these type of performances, it's laughable to me. And I can make the argument that with what you have this season, the way that Claude Giroux is playing, and the way that the veteran leadership, when AV calls out the veteran leaders and says, you guys do it for me, and I know that they stunk for 40 minutes, but they did back up and they walked the walk in the last 20 minutes against the the Buffalo Sabres in the game where they did come back. And at the time, in the heat of the moment, I didn't want to give them a lot of praise. And I'm not giving them a a lot of praise. But my point is, when you watch Claude this season, based off of all the surrounding issues with this team, once again, the farthest thing from the problem is Claude Giroux. If you get a two defensemen, if you get two defensemen, the eye set on the guy who wears the C is totally different. And it's crazy. And he was... Amazing with that backhander. Travis connected with a filthy pass, may I add, but really nice shot by Claude Giroux. And then beautiful pass from Jake Voracek to Giroux in the high slot. Found area, wide open space, and he ripped it top shelf. That was an outstanding shot. Picked the corner, and it was a rocket to tie the game. Where I have some problems, I didn't love the shootout. The people selected. Now, Sean Couturier hit the pipe. Who went second? Nolan Patrick? Nolan Patrick going second. It's like, I I know the stats might tell you. And here's the thing. I know from experience, there's guys that might not pop throughout a game, but they just have something with the shootout. And by no means am I trying to put myself on a pedestal here and say that I was some lethal weapon. But I was a stay-at-home defenseman who chipped pucks out of the zone, used the high glass, and made outlet passes, and went for a line change in 30 seconds. But when we did drills in the in the in the practices, we would do the 10 puck drill, and you would line 10 pucks up on the blue line on each blue line, and there would be two teams, and you're on the bench, and one guy would go out there. If you score, you keep going until all the 10 pucks are gone. But if you don't score, you go on the bench, and the next guy goes out, and it's a competition between two teams. I once went through all eight, I was I went when there were eight pucks left. I went through all eight pucks and I scored nonstop. And there were times where I got the nod to go in a shootout in a game because I, I actually had shown in practice that I got the filthy mitts and I'll be able to produce for you in a game when you need it. And it's like, really, bros, the stay-at-home defenseman? And if I don't score, you would question the coach. Well, this guy's a moron. Why would he put a stay-at-home defenseman out there? Well, I'm not going to lie. I showed it to you in practice, and I was able to deke the shit out of the goalies and bury it. And maybe it's because they laugh and think, really, you're sending bros at me? But guess what, damn it? I was ripping it past you, and I was deking you out of your jockstrap, and I was putting it backhand, top shelf, back bar. So... As much as I don't like it because it didn't work, it worked the last time you counted on Nolan Patrick in a shootout where he was able to filthy put it in a spot in a filthy way and score for you. As much as because it didn't work, it's easy to criticize Nolan Patrick. I know from experience there are guys that show that, hey, they have a little bit in their repertoire, even though in play 5-on-5 or in play during a power play, they might not show those same dangles that they have on a shootout. The numbers support going with him if you're A.V., although, like, I wasn't the biggest fan because of the execution, but I'm just putting my own personal experience on things where I know sometimes I got my number called, and you would think, really, you're you're going with this guy? But, you know, sometimes there's just players that have it, and maybe Nolan Patrick's that guy, and he just didn't bury that night. I I didn't, like, I thought Giroux had a really good chance on Sorokin. He just wasn't able to cash in. Really great save by Sorokin, too. And Voracek, that's the one I didn't love. His, I, I don't mind going to Voracek. I don't love his attempt. It was almost like he was trying to go five hole, but the five hole was never really open, and he just put it right into his pad. I didn't love the selection or the idea of the deke that he was trying to do. Not really a deke where he was trying to put the puck placement, but it's a shootout, and it's a coin flip at that point. It's 50-50. Good luck. 
the problem is you need points as much as you possibly can get them, and you let one slip. You can give them credit because this Islanders team, when they're up and they're leading, you're normally, especially after two periods, you're normally not coming back to grab any sort of point. So the fact that you did, you somewhat have to realize, like, hey, it was important, and the fact that the two guys that you need to rely on really did become an X factor in this game in Claude Giroux and Carter Hart, well, there's something to build off of maybe, but this Bruins stretch that you're about to have, you talk about how many games in hand the Bruins have with where the points are. These are crucial, and you got to get wins in regulation. You can't allow them to get one point when you get two, and you definitely can't allow them to get two points when you get none, or they get two points when you get one. It needs to be win in regulation, and there seems to be a, a knowledge of that. It seems like the team is realizing, look, we, we do not want to be in this situation. We're not happy that we're in this situation. We are in this situation, and it's must win territory. It seems like they know their back is against the wall against this Bruins team, and we'll see what the sense of urgency looks like when they fly out there on the ice knowing that. If they go out and lose 5-1, 6-1, and it looks like what it looks like against the Buffalo Sabres or against this Bruins team where they fall apart, they collapse, and Marshawn, Bergeron, Pasta, that line does work, and they just get obliterated knowing what they need to do, well, then it would be extremely disappointing and uh, really... Just put things into perspective. Now, before we get to the Anytime Hotline, I was listening to 31 Thoughts with Elliot Friedman, and he, the whole episode, the beginning segment of the 25 minutes to start the show, was I think it was about 25 minutes or so. It felt that way, at least. It doesn't really matter how long it was. He was talking about the Flyers, and it was like, okay, the story seems to be the Buffalo Sabres finally snapped their win streak, or their losing streak. <laughs> Not a win streak. They finally strapped their losing streak. What does this mean for the Flyers? And the way that they were talking about Chuck Fletcher and Travis Konechny, Nolan Patrick, it's like maybe it seemed like they were getting calls, phone calls, when they benched Travis Konechny and made that statement for his poor defensive play on 5-on-5. They were taking calls. They weren't taking calls. Excuse me. Let's get this all straight. Let's reset this. They were getting phone calls about Travis Konechny. And Nolan Patrick is also a name that he believes – People are checking up on. But the Flyers are unwilling to make a move on a player that was selected second overall so early in his career. But it does seem like where Nolan Patrick is mentally and everything he went through and what line he's playing on, it seems like there needs to be some new fresh blood, new fresh area, new fresh city for him to snap out of whatever funk he is here. Might be too much pressure, might be too much noise, and he might need to be in a different area. Maybe that's the case. But the fact that Travis Connecting, Nolan Patrick, phone calls, checking in, things of that nature are happening, there's going to be major changes. And they alluded to in this podcast that you're not going to see the same team come in here next season and there's going to be a shakeup with the core. They mentioned the word patient with Chuck Fletcher. He's a patient guy. And then they tied that to, it was very fascinating, Ron Hextall. Because Ron Hextall got fired because he was very patient. He was unwilling to make moves. He was unwilling to call up guys. He wanted to have his prospects. He wanted to grow the prospects. And it was going to be a slow transition into the minor leagues to the majors, and as if this is baseball, but the AHL to the NHL. And that was a problem with the way that the organization wanted to go. Then they mentioned, though, how much internal problems there were with the personality of Ron Hextall and all the behind-the-scene things that really forced the Flyers to have to head in another direction because there was some head-to-head smashing going on between maybe Paul Holmgren. and We know the story, though. We know how it all went down, the chicken wings in the locker room and how he tried to micromanage the whole entire situation. The major storyline out of that podcast, though, when the conversation was there's going to be maybe a mental change, a mental approach that flips because of where they are now. They already informed us, Chuck Fletcher, A.V., the front office, that this stretch is going to tell them what direction they are going to go. And it was about the expansion when you thought that you would keep three defensemen, which means you keep a certain amount of forwards, but three defensemen would be what you would try and keep. Ivan Provorov, Travis Sanheim, Phil Myers. But maybe they make a trade for the more long-term approach in an Ellis that type of player where now you're going to keep four defensemen and then you got to keep Claude Giroux, you got to keep 
someone like Kevin Hayes because of the way the contracts are constructed. But my point is, to summarize all this, where they are now, it might change their long term on the expansion draft and what they're going to do. Not so much to try and fix this year. It seems inevitable that this year is just not going to be fixed. There are so many issues. There are so many problems. The way you need to do this is you might have to make a splashy trade, but the splashy trade isn't necessarily to go out and try and make a run for this season and make that last playoff spot to try and make some noise. It would be more changing your franchise because that would allow another player to be available from a forwards perspective because you can only hold so many guys in your franchise when it comes to this expansion draft. So if you're going to flop to keeping four defensemen, if you go out and get that veteran piece, you now have someone else available for the Seattle Kraken to take in the expansion draft. So if you have to keep Claude, if you have to keep Kevin Hayes, I think there's going to be some guys that are available to Seattle. I don't know if Jake Voracek's contract is lovely enough to go out and snag. Same with JVR. And they also mentioned Scott Lawton being a UFA. Is he going to be a piece potentially? Because they want to keep him there and they like his skill set and they like what he brings. And it seems like they know that he wants to be a flyer and he loves the Philadelphia atmosphere and what the Philadelphia fan base stands for and all of it. But him being a UFA, him having the expiring contract, does that play a role at all in the possible trade for what Chuck Fletcher is going to do? It was just a really interesting conversation. If you haven't checked it out, it's called 31 Thoughts, and it's a uh, it's a podcast with the guys in uh, in Canada, Elliot Friedman, and, and they talk deeply into hockey, and they're very well connected, of course, with the league. And also, when I saw them as the Flyers being the main topic of discussion, of course, my eyebrows raised, and here we go. Now the Flyers are league-wide combo. Now it's, hey, it's not just a disaster here. It's a disaster to the entire hockey world. The day the Sabres snapped the most historic, one of the most historic losing streaks, it's not about what the Sabres did. It's about, wow, they dominated the Flyers for five out of six periods, and it's bonkers. Before we get to the Anytime Hotline calls, I do need to let you know about my friends over at DraftKings. The Final Four was insane for college basketball. The way Gonzaga won at the buzzer. Oh, what a shot to take down UCLA in overtime. One of the most historic games we saw. It relates to Villanova and UNC. The difference is Final Four compared to the national championship winner at the buzzer. I got to make sure my nod goes to Villanova for the best game we've seen. But that was up there, arguably second. Amazing. An all-time, all-time moment. And now you have Baylor versus Gonzaga. You will not want to miss all the action. Monday night, national championship. Use promo code BRODES. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Use promo code BRODES for all their phenomenal odds and promotion boosts for the game. And if college basketball isn't for you, Philadelphia Flyers and hockey, you also have pro basketball, golf, and so much more to bet on. Make sure right now you download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use promo code BRODES. That is promo code BRODES to get in on all of the action and promotion boosts for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older. Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply in partnership with Meadows Racetrack and Casino. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem. Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, here we go. The Anytime Hotline. Honestly, I can't be mad at this one because all the Giroux and Carter Hart doubters need to shut the fuck up because the two of them are the reason they had this goddamn point to begin with. As for the rest of the team, well, they need to seriously wash their faces off and question what they're doing because Konechny can't store store Kevin fuck <laughs> I love that though. I do. I love that. Your point came across and it's and it's valid. Guys like TK, you know, I was on 97.5 The Fanatic yesterday on Saturday and we got into a little bit of Flyers discussion and we went through a list. I think I actually have the list in this same notebook. And we were talking about untouchables. And I think I do have it somewhere here. And I, Aha, here you go. And we were talking about untouchables. We had Sean Couturier. This was a hypothetical, not so much based around the expansion draft, but just, just the standard like, hey, you're shooting the shit with your boys. Who's untouchable with the Flyers? Sean Couturier, Carter Hart, Joel Faraby, you, we said Ivan Provorov 95% of the time, but if the right, real, actual 
trade came your way where you couldn't turn it down, would you do it? If the right insane trade came around, probably, but there would be like a 2% chance maybe for that to actually happen. So I'd put Ivan Provorov on the list. But Travis Konechny was not. I would trade Travis Konechny for sure. You know, he was awesome, and he's a nice little player, but... Uh, there seems to be something that's missing out of his game. And am I overreacting to one season because last year he was very solid, but he was shut down in the playoffs. And yes, there's a growing period for young players to realize what it's like in the playoffs and how you're going to operate when time and space isn't there and when guys game plan for you because the other teams are making adjustments, putting your number one guys out against your number one guy. So it's going to be a battle back and forth. You're going up against their top D pairs and they're forcing you to make mistakes. Uh, Travis Konechny would be on the table for me for a trade for sure. Uh, he's not an untouchable. The thing with Ivan Provorov is this. He's 24 years old. You're not a stud, number one true guy for the most part. It's similar to the whole Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid thing. 28, 29, 30, 31. That's when you're Mr. Reliable. You know the game, the IQ. You understand uh, the NHL speed and the physicality, and you're more mature from the body structure perspective and from the mind part of the game, the IQ, you learn the little things. Because, like, Sidney Crosby, he might not be the most explosive player anymore, the fastest player anymore, but he knows the little things, the intangibles that you learn from just game after game and being a professional. Ivan Provorov, we're talking about trying to find a defenseman right now. It's so hard to find a defenseman. Why is that? You don't give up defensemen. Defensemen are hard to find. So there is a little bit of me that would be skeptical of moving Ivan Provorov because right now at the age of 24, I see him as a second defenseman on the top pairing. Not a true number one, but at age 28, 29, 30, we could be having a totally different conversation where he is that number one stud because he grows and blossoms into that number one stud. And I can see that happening. I don't think that's far-fetched. His contract, though, ends when he is about that age. So that's where things get a little wonky. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I would do it if the if the price is legitimately right, but I would say only maybe 2% chance that's the case. So how do we break down the Flyers game tonight? I think uh, that two-man advantage in the first period cost of the game. Kurt Hart looked great. Uh, it was nice to see him at least playing well. Uh, there was still way too many breakdowns for the Flyers and, I don't know what Nolan Patrick, like how bad is the rest of the team that he still gets this prime ice time? I just don't get it. That's a good point. For how trash everybody is, Nolan Patrick is still getting out there. But I guess here's the alternative, right? While we're frustrated and we're annoyed, this kid's the second overall pick. He's going to get an opportunity to play over a Twarinsky or... Some of these other guys that are on the taxi squad that you're looking at, and you know, they made a call up today for a first NHL game and all. Those players stink too. Those players aren't giving you much either. All oh, Bay Kubel, this guy, that guy. Well, I'm with you. I am so over this Nolan Patrick thing, and I think he's lost, and he's got no clue what he's doing out there, and he's got no confidence. And we've seen so many damn times in this city when a player loses his confidence, you are shot. You are done. Good luck. You are screwed. You're, you're done. You're over. It's just, it is what it is. Nolan Patrick seems to be in that mentality of, I don't know what I'm doing out there. Neither are the, these other guys are in the same boat, right? These other guys are in the same boat. So if you look at the ceiling side of it, while it might be hard to admit because of how we feel about him, the ceiling side of it all will say, well, if he was to snap out of it compared to where some of these other players are, if they play their best game, Nolan Patrick's ceiling is higher, so you just take that for what it is and hope and pray that he does uh, find a way. Or maybe there is something with the trade value. Maybe it's, hey, we got to get Nolan Patrick out there, give him opportunities to score, put him on the power play, try and get him in a great A scoring chance. So if he starts producing, it boosts that trade market value because no one's going out there and making trades for All Bay, Kubel, Twarinsky, Connor, Bunneman, all these names out there. Uh, those type of players, uh, maybe it's a trade value thing. I don't know. I'm searching for answers. Hey, Broads. I know the result that uh, that happened tonight here with the Flyers wasn't exactly what we wanted. I would have preferred to pick up that second point. But I've got to give credit to, uh, to Carter Hart tonight. I think this was the best game he played all season. He was absolutely phenomenal. And whatever he did in the week off it, he just, you know, you know just took – 
he changed. He he came back. I'm I'm impressed. You know, a lot of people were giving up on him this season. I don't think the Flyers should do that. I think he is still the future of the franchise. And if he could put together some more games like the one he just had tonight, Flyers are going to be okay. Well, giving up on Carter Hart is a very irrational take. It's the same people that want to strip the C. If you don't see what Carter Hart is, then I just don't think you understand the sport of hockey. It's that simple. To see a 22-year-old netminder and flash you what he gave you tonight, and it's been bad. But it's been bad solely because he has had hiccups along the way. He's had problems. You have you allowed 75 goals in 17 games. 75 goals in 17 games. 95% of those goals are because of the defensive problems in front of you. That is why Carter Hart struggled. Carter Hart struggled mostly because of everything that happened in front of you. If you think trading a 22-year-old franchise goalie because of the most historically pathetic defense in the world, where then you do not know hockey. You don't know anything. You're just a moron that screams that the Flyers are, are losing again without looking at the context, without studying the game, without looking at the personnel. You're just screaming to scream, and you want everything to be fixed with the snap of your fingers. What do you want, Brian Elliott? Guess what? Brian Elliott's getting his ass yanked. Why? Because the defense in front of him sucks. Brian Elliott wasn't performing at an elite rate once he started to play a little bit more. Why is that? Oh, because one, he's 30-plus years old, and he's playing in front of garbage defense. Alex Lyon allowed goals. Why is that? Because he's playing in front of garbage defense. All these goalies, like, don't you see a common theme here? All the goalies in the net are getting lit up. Why do you think that is? It's really not that hard to comprehend. Um, in, in terms of like the effort, like I'm not mad tonight or I'm not disappointed tonight. There's a lot of that surrounding this team. And yes, I, I mean, there's two ways to look at it. Am I upset with their effort and their battle and the way that they snagged the point? No. But where you put yourself at this point is you can't be satisfied. So they put themselves in this situation where I can't just be satisfied with the one point because you desperately need everything you can possibly get. So, I'm understanding that you're playing the Islanders, you're down 2 nothing. they're leading after 2, statistically, good luck trying to find a way to do anything, and they did, and I recognize that, and two guys played at an awesome level that makes me happy, but you costed yourself so early on with all the mistakes, not so much early on in this game, although yes, that is a part of it, I just meant early on in this season, you were so putrid that uh, you put me in a position where I can't be fully okay with it because you got to win the shootout. You have to win the shootout. Broads, I've been trying to be positive about the, the Flyers. You know, I always want to be positive about my Philadelphia sports teams. But the Flyers stunk tonight. A shootout lost the line first. The only good thing I can say is Carter Hart finally had a good game. And we got a tough schedule coming up. I don't know where we go moving forward. All right, well, that was a little bit on the negative side, I would say. And, that, and that's almost a little too far to the extreme. So I, I don't like the people that are okay with this, like satisfied fully, but then to say they stunk. Well, yeah, I mean, they, like, here's reality, too. If you think there's going to be a stretch where they just have zero errors and they make zero mistakes and they become the team that you wanted them to be in the beginning of the year, well, then you're just way off base. You're off touch. So you know that there's going to be – Pizza's up the middle. You know there's going to be turnovers in the slot. You know there's going to be mistakes in the gray areas right inside your own blue line that might cost you, and then Bavoulier ends up getting a good scoring chance. Those are going to happen. It's about limiting those to a little bit more of a reasonable degree that keeps you involved in a game where you might be able to pounce and score on the other side. Uh, did they absolutely stink tonight? No, I don't think they stunk tonight. I, I thought that was a little extreme, but you can't be okay with the one point because they said or not they said, but they put you here. They put you in this spot where you can't be okay with this because of falling behind, because of nightmare problems, because of being in fifth place right now and having to try and earn their way back against the Bruins, who is their next opponent in a couple games, and I can't wait to see how they play. I really can't. So with that being said, thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you next time.